from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you, make your own personalised keto. I'll be asking my guests each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Thank you, Adrian Price and Mia Thousand, for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Do you want to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? Then head to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you will get to headline the show just like Adrienne and Mia did today. This week's extraordinary woman is Amber O'Hearn. Amber O'Hearn, MSc, is a data scientist by profession with a background in math, computer science, linguistics and psychology. She has been studying and experimenting with ketogenic diets since 1997, and more recently writing and speaking about her findings. Her review on the evolutionary appropriateness and benefit of weaning babies onto a meat-based, high-fat, low-carb diet was included as testimony defending Tim Noakes in his recent trial. Amber has been eating a carnivorous diet for over eight years. She writes a blog which she describes as Eclectic Explorations on the Science of Ketogenic Diets at ketotic.org and also has a personal blog page which is mostly about her experiences with carnivory at Empirica. That's empiri.ca. You can support Amber and the fantastic work she does by making a pledge at her Patreon page. Amber is speaking at Low Carb Breckenridge and her lecture is called Ketosis Without Starvation, The Human Advantage. Details about all of these can be found in the show notes at ketowomanpodcast.com. I've been looking forward to talking to Amber and putting the questions to her that you wanted answers to. I could have quite easily gone on to part three, to be honest, as she has such a wealth of information to share. As it is, we had to split the recording into two parts. Here is the second part of the interview where Amber continues to answer your questions. Welcome back, Amber, to the Keto Women podcast. This is part two of our marathon discussion on zero carb and carnivore. Thank you. I'm ready. (laughs) Let's dive straight back in to the ever contentious topic of protein. Uh, We'll kick off with a question from Josie Sands. My question is the science behind additional protein. I'm finding I'm quite sensitive and cutting back has helped with hunger signaling. Does that mean zero carb may not be right for me until I heal more? That's a great question. So protein does give some what of an insulin response, not as much as carbohydrate. And the level is going to depend on what your basal insulin level is. So if you've got hyperinsulinemia, it's going to be probably you're already at a compromised starting position. 
and it's going to depend on your pancreas. Then that level of insulin that's released because of the protein should probably um, reduce blood sugar, but then that's going to cause a demand for more blood sugar. So what that's going to end up at ultimately is depends on a lot of different factors. But one thing we do know is that unlike other species, humans have the ability to eat more than simply an adequate amount of protein and stay in ketosis as long as your carbohydrates are low. That's simply different from any other species as far as we know. And a second thing that we know, at least anecdotally, is that if you go on a zero-carb carnivorous diet, a lot of people have reported that they're experiencing an ability to reach a higher level of ketosis with the same amount of protein. I don't know why that is. It might be explained simply by um, some level of carbohydrates, because if you're doing a ketogenic diet and you're eating 20 grams of carbohydrates, for example, if you take away 20 grams of carbohydrate, you can eat a whole 40 more grams of protein before there's even the material available to make that much carbohydrate into your blood. So it could simply be that. I have suspicions that there might be other mechanisms going on, but that's one thing that you might play around with. And then finally, I would say, if you tried a zero-carb carnivorous diet, and you were still having problems with hunger that was leading to a result that you didn't like when you ate to that hunger. For example, if you were having high blood sugar levels because you have a history of diabetes, or if it's affecting your mood, um, or if there's weight gain that goes on and on and doesn't seem to resolve, then you could try playing with macros and still retain the plant-free aspect of the diet and you still might have benefits over just a low-carb diet. So there's a lot to explore there based on your own individual history and your own responses. I, I would say I wouldn't rule it out just theoretically based on your current response to protein in ketosis right now. Yes, I've, I've definitely heard that, that there's people who are worried about increasing protein and how that's going to impact their blood sugar. It's just a whole different playing field when you're removing all those, even the reduced amount of carbohydrates that you're eating. As soon as they are taken out of the equation, the impact that the protein has just completely changes. That's what I would say. Yeah, that's why I think it warrants some experimentation. A history of type 2 diabetes does also change what's going to happen. And so I, I don't know for sure what the impact for someone would be if that's where they're coming from. They might have to be more conservative. Exactly. And also test, you know, especially if you, if you are worried about it, the chances are that you're testing your uh, blood sugars quite regularly anyway. So, you know, just, just carry on doing that and monitor as you go into eating this way and see what happens agreed um okay so this is a question carrying on in the same vein from siobhan huggins a common question would be is gluconeogenesis demand or supply driven is it based on context such as metabolically healthy versus not that's a great question i i think that the idea that gng is Supply-based is wrong for several reasons. One is that there are early experiments showing that if you just gave the liver all of the components to make glucose, it didn't just make glucose. So there had to be more going on than that. I think the biggest determinant of gluconeogenesis is the insulin-to-glucagon ratio. And also keep in mind that what upregulates gluconeogenesis upregulates ketogenesis, so they're not exactly in opposition. The thing that people are worrying about, I think, is this phenomenon. They're trying to explain this phenomenon where if you eat an unlimited amount of protein, at some point, ketogenesis is going to it's gonna hit a threshold and you're not going to be making as many ketones. And the question is, why is that happening? What I think is that 
again, the protein is going to have an insulin response. And if the insulin to glucagon ratio gets sufficiently high, then that's going to slow down the rate of ketogenesis because and gluconeogenesis. But when the ketogenesis goes down, suddenly tissues that are demanding energy are going to be getting it from glucose because there's not as much ketone bodies available. And then that kind of is a per- self-perpetuating cycle. That's one idea. <laughs> um, another thing that I know is that um, the material for gluconeogenesis, the, whether it's protein or lactate or something else, doesn't um, doesn't immediately go into um, blood sugar that's being used for energy. It go it, it goes to fill glycogen stores first. So it's really a much more complex cycle than just you know some kind of awareness that your body has that okay i've had enough protein for the day now we're going to turn it all into sugar exactly there are no simple equations here are there and these terms get thrown about you know when when someone mentions uh, protein or maybe too much protein someone else will just throw out uh, you know gluconeogenesis and these terms just get thrown about but there there isn't a simple equation and it really does come down again to the individual and what their own makeup is and how they operate you know perhaps things like how much exercise they do comes into the equation on on how everything works in their own body right that reminds me another idea about gluconeogenesis that does get thrown around that isn't accurate is that this is something that doesn't happen unless you eat too much protein. But that's that's not the case at all. Gluconeogenesis is happening all the time because you're not eating all the time and you you need your blood sugar has to be at this steady level. So the great thing about ketogenic diets is that when you take away all that exogenous source of glucose, suddenly your body gets to make it for you at exactly the right rate. And the reason it makes it at exactly the right rate is because gluconeogenesis is constantly adjusting to what your needs are. Exactly. We have to be functioning 24-7 regardless of what we're putting into our body. Our body doesn't just switch things on and off depending what we've eaten does it right it's a it's a much more adaptive kind of system right a question from louise reynolds i've noticed that my morning blood glucose readings are slightly higher is that because i've eaten too much protein i was doing so well and this week dot 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 same with hubby too again that may go back to individual differences about protein. It could be a one-off. I'm not sure what Louise's history with diabetes is. Um, But it's also something that happens with a non-carnivorous ketogenic diet. Sometimes we see people have a, a general rise in their fasting blood sugar up to a certain point. And at this point... I think people consider it quite safe as long as it's not, you know, much above 100. So it's really hard to tell. I hope that that resolved for her. Yes, and it could be presumably just simply an adjustment phase because she's changed the way she's eating. True. Okay, another question from Erin McFarland. How is it possible that zero carb promotes autophagy, as is the claim of many veterans of this diet? Yet protein is said to activate mTOR, thus shutting down that process. What do you think about certain supplements or medications that supposedly decrease mTOR? For example, metformin, green tea, turmeric. Yes, I know they are plant-based, but there's a lot of research claiming that they suppress mTOR. And utilizing these in the context of a higher protein diet to mitigate the possible deleterious effects of protein on autophagy. I love this question. (laughs) So one useful way of looking at metabolism is that we have basically two states. We have the fed state and the fasting state. And the fed state is generally associated with synthesizing things, synthesizing tissues or mitochondria or neurons. And the fasted state is associated with autophagy and preparation for repair. 
tearing less good things down to make room for better things and then signaling what more we need that's better. Like, do we want to make more mitochondria now? Do we want to make more uh, neurons now? Um, so we called it the fed state and the fasting state because, well, <laughs> I think it's mainly because by the time we started studying these things, humans were already on a very high-carb diet. So the ketogenic phase was necessarily the fasting stage because basically you had to stop eating for a couple days to go into that phase. Um, so a recent paper, I think it came out last year in Nature, was talking about this. They were talking about metabolic switching, and they were calling it the K phase and the G phase, so a ketogenic phase and a glucose or glycolytic phase, because ketosis is really the hallmark of the autophagy fasted state phase. A lot of people think it's really important that you switch between these modes. They say that if you stay too long in the fed state, you're going to develop problems like, well, you're just not going to get a chance to clear out the cells and do that kind of repair. And you're going to set yourself up for metabolic syndrome by having this constant rate of the overfed state. And then on the other side of it, they say if you're if you're too often in this fasted state, then that's that's kind of starvation and it's stressful. That's one of the main sources of this idea that ketosis is stressful because ketosis is characteristic of that phase. But the thing is that humans have this cool ketosis superpower in which... <laughs> Well, first of all, we get into ketosis really fast compared to all other animals, and we get in way deeper than other animals, and especially children. Um, before adulthood, it's basically the inverse of your age, how quickly you get into ketosis. And then secondly, we can do it even more when you're getting adequate protein so that we're actually fully fed. As long as carbs are restricted, and as long as you don't go too much over the adequate protein level, I haven't seen any really good studies getting at this directly, but I would say somewhere between one and a half and two and a half times of protein, you're still in ketosis more than any other animal would normally be. And what this means is, first of all, if you're on a uh, carnivorous diet or even a ketogenic diet, and you're eating enough, so you're not actually in starvation or in protein starvation, the time it takes to get from the fed mode <laughs> to ketosis is really, really short. It's basically between meals. And this means that we get to have these cycles of autophagy and synthesis every single day without even fasting, <laughs> which is really, really cool. And if if you wanted to, for some reason, intensify those cycles, all you would have to do is eat bigger, more infrequent meals of just protein and fat and don't eat in between. And basically you're getting that ideal thing that people are saying that humans need, which is the, both of those cycles so that you can clean out and build. Whereas if you were eating a non-ketogenic diet, you would have to fast for many days to be able to initiate this kind of healthy ideal. Uh, so you're getting much more bang for your buck in a much shorter period of time when you're you're eating this way. And I, I mean, a lot of people do talk about the benefits of just shortening their eating window so that their natural everyday fast is just that that bit longer. Right. And and people will use the word um, pulsatility too. They'll say you want insulin, but you just want it to be quick and high, and then go away and have that fasting. So the sort of short answer is, yes, protein does tell mTOR. mTOR is kind of a signal that says we've got nutritionally complete diet, but it's not as bad as it seems because that, that difference for humans between fasting and fed is a much uh, more dynamic thing if you're not eating carbohydrates. Another thing that, um, that that fasting state and and the fed state does in other animals, because the, the fed state and the mTOR are signaling that there's nutritional adequacy, 
When they're in that state, they will have good reproduction. And when they're not detecting it, reproduction is sometimes traded right off for, and that's where some longevity research comes in, uh, what happens is the organism basically says, this is not a good enough environment to reproduce. Let's hold off, slow everything down, use as little energy as possible so that we can live longer and see a time when there's going to be enough nutrients. But fortunately, humans don't really have to do that. We don't have to compromise on protein to be able to get all the, these benefits. I think it's, I think it's amazing and it may have something to do with the reason that humans have such a long life expectancy in the first place. I wanted to also touch on, um, Aaron mentioned certain plant sources that are supposed to also inhibit mTOR. My speculation about those, th those are anything that has a bitter taste, basically, will send those signals to go into autophagy. And I think that, or autophagy, I'm not sure how to pronounce that right. Bitter signals from plants signaling to go into autophagy seems to me to be at least highly suggestive that when we were resorting to eating plants in the past, it was because we weren't getting enough food. And, and that idea, if it's correct, has enormous implications for the roles of plants in our evolutionary history. Right. It's interesting what you're saying about Basically, we're getting more of the benefits with shorter fasts than people who are eating a lot of carbohydrates would do with the same period of, of fasting every day. What are your feelings on this? It's, it's a real buzzword at the moment, isn't it? Um, autophagy and, and how there seems to be, uh, you know, people talking about, well, you need to fast for a given period to get the maximum benefits from it, that the 48 hour mark is, is one that's particularly cited as you need to get to the 48 hour mark and then all the magic happens. But, you know, what sounds like what you're saying is that, that you're getting a lot of those benefits from much shorter periods of fasting. Yes. Well, I think that if a high carbohydrate diet human takes 48 hours to start getting benefits, then someone who's on a ketogenic diet is getting benefits uh, essentially right after they stop eating. And then on the other hand, <laughs> it, it's better than that because some people say that you really shouldn't fast for longer than about 48 hours because then your lean mass starts to get compromised. If that's the case, then as a ketogenic dieter, you've got a huge advantage because you can go ahead and not eat anything for two whole days before your lean mass starts to get compromised and you've gotten all that extra time in fasting if that's, you know, if you, if you feel that that's what your health needs right now. Exactly. That's an interesting point that I know is, is another hotly debated topic of this loss of lean body mass. I mean, I've, I've seen people fasting for a lot longer than that and doing DEXA scans at the beginning and at the end and, and showing possibly even an, an increase in, in lean body mass. So it's, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a, it's a difficult topic, isn't it? <laughs> it is because, the, well, in part because the personalities and opinions are so heated. Um, there seems to be a lot at stake in being right. But what we, we, we just really want to know what the answer is, right? And, and it, exactly. <laughs> it could, it could be that if you start out ketogenic, you've got an advantage. Or it could be that other things could, um, improve your chances of retaining lean mass. Like electrolytes might play into it. Um, or, or other components of your diet or whether or not you're exercising. So there's a lot to be explored if we could, Stop worrying about, you know, being the one who's got the final say. Yeah. Who's right. <laughs> yeah. It would be great if there was a, a nice, simple uh, test for autophagy, wouldn't there? To <laughs> and you mentioned electrolytes there. And, that, uh, you know, that's, that's another thing that's, that's spoken about a lot, particularly with, with keto. And I don't know how much with, with, eating carnivore is the importance of salt do you find that you know do you supplement with salt basically either by putting it on your food or taking a certain amount every day do you find that's important this is an area where i feel i might be coming to a change of mind and i feel like i know less than i 
thought I knew earlier. So, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, you know, when I started the carnivorous diet, I eschewed all spices and added salt, and I never really had a problem. Um, so when I started hearing recommendations for eating higher salt, I was very skeptical of them. Um, in part because I didn't feel that I needed them, in part because I felt like maybe there's some, it's based on carbohydrate levels, and if you're not eating carbohydrate, then maybe your need for salt is less. And I still think there might be something to that, uh, especially in the high carbohydrate case. More to the point, even the good <laughs> epidemiologically based arguments for it say that, oh, actually the mortality is better when the salt is a bit higher, but that's in high carbohydrate people. So I don't know that that translates to people on a ketogenic diet. For all I know, we need a lot less. And so I started seeing these very, what I felt were weak arguments for eating more salt, and I just wasn't having any of it. Um, then recently there was a blog post on Verda Health that talked about the importance of salt during ketogenic diets to uh, preserve adrenal function, and it seemed like a pretty compelling argument, and so that kind of opened my mind a little bit. I started reading a bit about um, the importance of salt in... in um, brown adipose thermogenesis, and I don't have any conclusions to tell you, but I know that there's something in there that's connecting those things. And I knew already that a lot of athletes swear by adding salts, and I thought, well, maybe this is important if you're sweating a lot, but otherwise not important. And then finally, I had some experiences of my own where I tried, finally, for the first time after eight years or whatever, taking some water and adding salt and potassium to it, and in particular on days where I was trying fasting, which also I don't really do very much, but I've done a couple of times out of interest. And I felt it had a big impact on my hunger and on my, I'm not sure, I'm going to have to do more experiments to be absolutely sure, but it seemed to me that my ketosis level rose faster with electrolytes rather than not. And so now w with all of this different data, I'm beginning to think maybe there really is something there and that it could be beneficial. Um, I mean, I always thought that it was not necessary, but not necessarily harmful either. And now I'm thinking it might actually be of benefit. So this is something something that I'm exploring and I don't have a firm opinion on yet. Right. I think there's there's a woman in my group and I wish I could remember her name. I'll try and find the post and tag you into it. But she's been doing a lot of experimentation. She thinks she's overly sensitive to salt and she's been doing experimentation, having blood tests and things and decreasing her salt and has, has found a lot of benefits. But it, most people seem to say the opposite, that they find when they start keto. And then that's what I was wondering about the difference if there was any with with carnivore that they needed to increase their salt and often things like just getting into keto and the keto flu that people talk about and then various other things like sometimes feeling a bit dizzy and things like that the the suggestion is always or not always but usually is to look at electrolytes in particular salt yes and that's true i think that the Potassium and magnesium could also have an effect on how much salt you need. It might be the case that if you have a lot of potassium, you need less sodium or, or the opposite. I'm not sure how they all interact. And another um, thing to take into account, I've, I've always thought it was a good idea to supplement electrolytes during that transition. And it's quite possible that if you're on a carnivorous diet, you're going in and out of ketosis or you're on the borderline more often. So that could be a reason why it might be more beneficial. I don't know. Interesting. On the other hand, there are people who are, are carnivorous and say they feel better without salt. Again, <laughs> comes comes down to the individual, doesn't it? And and the easiest way to find out is to try with and without, I guess, and, and see how you feel. Right. And then not necessarily think that what you've found this time is going to be true for once and for all, because as things change, as your weight shifts, or if your insulin starts to improve, or, or you start eating more or exercising, you, you might want to revisit it. 
Exactly. And as you mentioned before, you know, how much you're sweating. I mean, I find in particular that when I'm working, I work as a gardener, when I'm working in the summer, when it's really hot, I find it really important, you know, that every time I stop for a drink, I have these little foil packages which look a bit suspect of salt but I have you know I have it's and they're about half a teaspoon and I have that with my water and I do find that makes a difference to how well I cope with the heat and the work nice right so moving on to some more questions uh, this is from Kristin Nicole how much meat do you eat per day? <laughs> it, nice and simple question. <laughs> yes. It has varied over the years. I eat to hunger and I don't always measure. But um, I would say generally I eat one and a half to two pounds of meat a day. Right. And predominantly, like you said, you, you, like you said before, I think that that's, that's usually beef, is it? But you vary it up, vary it a bit. Yes. But ribeyes if you can get them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> A question from Joey Vorter. How hard is it to eat to total daily energy expenditure? How much meat are we looking at to do this? For example, she says that her total daily energy expenditure is 1800 calories. I need to make sure I'm eating to this to continue healing my metabolism from the nearly two decades of severely under eating and over activity. And I know this, uh, this will be something that will uh, interest Erin too. Well, I do think it's really important to heal your body by giving it enough fuel and enough nutrients. So I'm all for that goal. I don't know if you can tell that by calculating a number. I think it's going to change. It's going to change as you change, as you grow, as your tissues heal. And it's just going to change on a daily basis how much energy you're expending. So what I would do is Try really hard to tune in to your hunger and figure out when you have had enough to eat. And then maybe eat a little bit more beyond that because, honestly, if, the, if your hunger is working the way it should, if that was too much, you'll, you'll feel hungry a little bit less next time. And so it should balance out. But r just retraining yourself to really take seriously your hunger, I think is the best way to get to that. And just as a ballpark round figure, I just mentioned that I eat about one and a half to two pounds a day. I'm five, six, not terribly active. I mean, I run around with stuff, but I'm not doing any regular aerobic exercise. So if it's significantly less than that, then I would start to maybe think about trying to eat a little more. I think... It is that balance and I can see why these two women that I, that I do know about them and their history with some eating disorder is the concern and it happens with, with keto as well as uh, zero carb carnivore that you find that your appetite decreases. And if you have a history of not eating enough and especially if you feel that that your brain might not be giving you the right signals. I can see why you would want to have this daily amount that, that you made sure you always met. Because if you didn't fully feel that you could trust your body to give you accurate signals and, and you would be worried about getting into that pattern again of, of losing too much weight, I can see why it would be important to have a number even though it is unreliable, as we've we've spoken about already. That does make sense, and I can imagine kind of habituating to a low level of hunger that doesn't register to your brain as actual hunger just because you're used to ignoring it. And then if that, that appetite suppressant thing of ketosis kicks in, suddenly the suddenly <laughs> you're you're gonna eat that much less and get to that feeling. So I guess that's a really good point. Um, I just think it's really hard to set a number, even if you gave me your height and your weight and your daily level of activity. I still think there might be a lot of variance. So it's, mm -hmm. it's and might take yes, some. Yes, and I think I think it's just being aware, isn't it, and and knowing that if you have tendencies to under eat to over exercise that you just have to be 
hyper aware of, of what's going on and that the danger is sometimes the more restrictive you get with your diet the more you have a tendency to eat less and less so I suppose it's not so much being a slave to a number but it's very much being aware of you know of your weight and if you start losing weight then you need to you need to look again at maybe ignoring your satiety signals and eating a given amount Mm -hmm. yeah and maybe like you said relying more on external feedback that's less subjective like if you're losing weight um yeah it's a tricky one you're right Mm. yes it it is and and it, it it's just being aware i think and and like you say relying on other people and listening to other people and their concerns if they have them Okay, this is a question from Holly Davidson. I have PCOS and I'm insulin resistant. How much meat can I have per day? Is there a limit? Would the protein affect insulin or any other hormones? Does the kind of meat matter? Does the quality matter? With insulin resistance, again, the thing I would worry about is your basal insulin rate interfering with how much protein you can have before it affects blood sugar levels. But I think if you're checking blood sugar, um, that's probably enough feedback to go by to make sure that you're not overeating protein in that particular situation. In terms of quality of meat, I think that there may be some optimization available in getting particularly farmed kinds of meat, but I think you're probably 98 or 99 percent of the way there just getting meat in the first place, and it's more of an optimization based on your financial ability and your particular health needs. Exactly. So, yes, obviously, if you can afford it, having the the best quality and the grass-fed and all the other buzzwords that go with it are are fantastic but it's not going to it's not going to ruin everything if you can't afford all of that not remotely brilliant this is from louise reynolds does zero carb have to be nose to tail to get the full complement of micronutrients does it really mean i have to eat liver (laughs) she's not a fan of liver (laughs) i'm still traumatized by my childhood and my mother making me eat liver with onions capsicum and zucchini (laughs) following on from that how does zero carb go with marty kendall's micronutrient optimizer (laughs) when there are no vegetables (laughs) that's also a great question um so This is contentious. Of course, a lot of the deepest criticisms about carnivorous diets, especially the way that many people do them in practice, which is to eat primarily or only steak, which is not, of course, any kind of constraint of a carnivorous diet, but it is what a lot of people are doing. The criticism is that that's not going to be nutrient sufficient and that you have to eat liver and you have to eat organs to in order to get all the things that you need. The fact is, it's really not well known, and you can't just extrapolate from the RDAs to say, oh, here we know what all the RDAs are, so let's build your carnivorous diet to make sure that you get the exact amounts of all these things. And the reason why you can't do that is because all the RDAs are based on a high-carb diet. And you might think, oh, why should that matter? Why should that affect how much folate I need, for example, or how much iron I need? And the reason is, well, there are many reasons. One is that a ketogenic metabolism means that you're generating ATP in a different way from when you're generating it from glucose. And what vitamins really are, are coenzymes that are needed for metabolic processes. And if you switch the metabolic process that you're predominantly using, suddenly all those needs and rates and amounts could drastically change. Another thing that can happen is that uh, rates of recycling can change. So for example, um, with, with vitamin C, we know now that glucose burning interferes with vitamin C uptake. And if you just simply stop eating so much glucose, the amount of vitamin C that you need is less. And, and that's that's a significant difference. Um, similarly, I brought up folate a little while ago, which is one of the things that's in liver that people care about a lot. And um, 
I don't know all the answer to how much folate you actually need, but I did notice that there was a study on fasting and non-fasting people during Ramadan. And this is not even total fasting, it's just intermittent fasting where you're not fast where you're not eating between sunrise and sunset. And they noticed a significant rise in folate in the fasting people um, that's completely not attributable to anything they were eating. So, I, And I think it must just have to do with the usage patterns. So it could be the case that if you're in a ketogenic metabolism which resembles fasting, suddenly your folate needs might be quite different. And then thirdly, plants are full of of anti-nutrients. They're quite notorious for that. So there are examples, for example, I've seen from Georgia Ede, where they show the amount of zinc that gets into your system from eating oysters, and then the amount that if you eat oysters plus wheat, and it just like drops to the floor. (laughs) And so if you suddenly remove all these anti-nutrients, the amount of the nutrient that you then need may in fact be a lot less. So the bottom line is we don't know if you need to eat liver. It's possible that you don't. It's possible that you could go for years on end without eating any liver and all of those nutrients would be just at fine levels. I wouldn't you know, want to bet my life on it necessarily. Um, there are tests you can take and if you're really concerned about it, you can either, you could take a supplement. I mean, it's not the end of the world to take a supplement or you could learn to like liver. I love liver, so it's not a problem for me, that particular one. But we, we just don't know what the answer to that is. It's a fascinating theory, and it does seem completely logical to me, that the goalposts just completely move. So, like you were saying, all these amounts of things that you need, you know, all this vitamin C that we're supposed to need, and all these other antioxidants, and this vitamin, and that nutrient, and we just don't need as many of them necessarily by not eating certain groups of food. That that It does really make, make sense to me. I'm eager to mm, yeah. get more studies about it, although there are certain ones that we couldn't really ethically repeat, like who's going to volunteer to get deficient in vitamin D or or something. <laughs> exactly. like, just wait till you get rickets and then you can stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this is, this is kind of following on from that, really. Um, A.D. Price, can zero carb heal muscles? For example, would I not need to take magnesium pills? Somebody on Twitter apparently has told her that she wouldn't need to, but she hasn't found anything to back up this claim. My left arm has been twitching and I think I need more magnesium in my diet, uh, more spinach and almonds, she says. And this is something that impacts me. I get dreadful restless legs unless I take my magnesium supplement every night. But I, I do wonder, and I'm very wary of over supplementing because I always worry about how you can throw the balance out of of other things by potentially taking too much of, of one vitamin or nutrient, what you're going to do with the balance in your body of everything else. But I know for me certainly that, that magnesium I notice if I don't take my magnesium supplement, I get dreadful restless legs. But it sounds like she's been told that potentially eating zero carb carnivore is going to help with things like that. It might and it might not. It depends it depends on your magnesium status in the first place. It could be that you just need to take some for a while until you get enough and then you don't need it anymore. It could be that you have some ongoing issue that requires more. It could be that in the past um, our magnesium was covered by our water and now we're drinking water that is not just doesn't have enough electrolytes in it. I agree with you that we're kind. It's kind of a crapshoot to take one thing and not the other and try to guess like the calculated amount that you need of something. But if you have something really specific, like you're getting leg cramps or restless leg syndrome in the night, and you take magnesium and it resolves, gosh, I'd take it. <laughs> and you know, other people can talk until they're blue in the face about how you don't need it, but obviously you do. Exactly. The whole n equals one. Yes, again, <laughs> I'm. Uh, yeah, it's 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 probably my catchphrase that I use most often. Really, <laughs> it's what what works for you. Um, okay, so this is a question from Catherine Wolf. Being zero carb, is there any point to taking probiotics? 
As most probiotics are supported by carbs and fiber, so if we take them on zero carb, do they just die? I'm not even sure what gut bacteria are cultivated on a zero carb food map. That's a great question too. I mean, even carnivores in the wild have a gut microbiome. It's just going to be different and it changes very quickly. We've seen research that shows that even just in a matter of four or five days, your whole um the strains that are thriving versus other ones is going to change. But my take on probiotics, at least the ones that people are selling and claiming a great health benefits about, is that what those probiotics do is they feed and increase the volume and health of strains that are helping with plant digestion. <laughs> because our colons are much, much smaller than other primates in the way ours were before we evolved these big brains and gave up most of our colons. We don't, we just don't have a lot of capacity. We have, we do have a microbiome. We have lots going on there, but relatively speaking, it's not very much. We can't eat more than, I don't know, 25 or 30 grams of fiber without potentially causing intestinal distress. And it just doesn't account for a lot. What I'm thinking is that if you're going to eat plants and the strains that help with that digestion haven't been properly cultivated, then yes, maybe you'll benefit from increasing them. But if you're not eating plants in the first place, why bother cultivating those strains in the first place? And it doesn't make any sense to me evolutionarily speaking. If you believe that we went without plants for four days at a time ever, (laughs) then The idea that we would have to um, maintain these um, specific strains seems just not very plausible to me. Another argument that people sometimes give about it, and this is going to um, lead into another question that I know someone has asked, it's that some people argue that The reason that we know fermented foods are beneficial for us is because if you look at the traditional cultures, they've all got some kind of fermented food. Therefore, it must have served some kind of purpose for us that made it healthy, and and we somehow gathered this knowledge over the years and kept it in our diets. Well, I see this really quite differently. I think what happened is that when we gave up the colon, we just, or not the whole colon, but this great amount of the colon, We really gave up our ability to process much plant material. And because of that, we we just weren't putting a lot of plants through our system anymore. And if we really wanted to be able to digest plants well, we kind of had to outsource the digestion of that. And so when we found that if you fermented it, it would take away some of the toxicity, it would make it more digestible, it would make it easier and make the nutrients more bioavailable. So again, if that's the reason why fermented foods have become important to humans, I think it's because we we had this really high meat diet and then we lost the megafauna and suddenly had to eat more plants again and found that we couldn't do it without some outside help. That makes so much sense to me and it's It's really along the same lines that that we've just been talking about with vitamins and minerals, that if you eat in this way, you just don't need the same amount. Just like you're saying, I love I love that phrase you used about you have to outsource part of your (laughs) digestive system to these fermented foods. And I know it you know, the the Korean way of eating gets gets cited as one of the healthiest in the world because they have kimchi with with every meal they eat. But what you just said makes perfect sense. They're having to take this supplemental food with the meal they're eating to perform part of their digestion. That's what I'm thinking. So the other argument is we're actually benefiting from getting that bacteria into our body. And one reason why I think that might not be the case besides that whole story that I just came up with um, <laughs> is that the we have a really acidic stomach pH. In fact, some researchers have surmised that the reason why people have such acidic stomachs is to prevent bacteria from getting through our digestion, possibly because of a link to our to scavenger behavior in the past where um, 
there was just more exposure to dangerous pathogens. And that means that very few bacteria actually make it down into our gut to cultivate. I'm not sure that the stuff in yogurt or kimchi really gets down there to any great degree. Although, as somebody pointed out to me, it only takes one. <laughs> True. <laughs> but it, it, it really, yeah, it really fascinates me, the, this concept that if you don't actually need it in the first place, you know, so, so the question of do I need fermented foods? Well, potentially not if you're not eating the kind of foods that it needs to help right. you digest. Maybe fermented cabbage is better than cabbage, but if you're not eating cabbage, you don't need the fermented cabbage, is, I guess is my idea. <laughs> we could go round and round, <laughs> couldn't we? But I like, the, I like the logic. I have a very logical brain and it appeals to me. The other thing about probiotics that I kind of object to is the idea that we know what a healthy gut biome looks like. The only reason we think we know is that we have a collection of associations between disease states and gut strains in high-carb dieters. And whether or not that applies remotely to someone who's on a low-carb diet, let alone a plant-free diet, it just... I don't think we're there <laughs> and to be able to state that. Yes, that's the, that's the thing, isn't it, that, that keep coming back to, that if you're basing this, this knowledge and the experimentation and recommended daily allowances on a high-carb diet, it's just probably not applicable to, you know, most of us in this community. At base, it would be like saying, if you're on a high-carb diet and you're showing ketones in the blood, yeah, that's a sign of real danger. But if you're on a ketogenic yeah. diet, uh, well, no, duh, of course you do. Exactly. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a funny one now. Okay. Actually, did, I know, uh, well, we both know who asked this question, <laughs> but we're not allowed to put her name to it. <laughs> so please don't put my name to this question. But the first week of Zero Carb, I was a sexy, horny minx. <laughs> oh my God, is this what I can expect? No wonder Amber is a delicious kick-ass bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm afraid the answer is yes, that is what you can expect. It's perfectly normal and it's not going away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many people are going to are going to complain about that. No, nope. unless you haven't got an outlet for it. <laughs> <laughs> right, get just make problematic. sure your partner's also on a zero carb diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one is from Zylinda Moore. I want to know how one's blood work might change, especially B vitamins. Would it help them or not? iron labs and micronutrient labs or whatever else a serious zero carb person might measure. I'm imagining the calcium score would only improve since this is lower carb. I love my zero carb group, but it's been sparse on the lab testing results. Yeah, and I've been a little bit negligent about keeping up with lab work myself, although I have plans to get some new ones. I think it's been about five years. But I think mo for the most part, what you'd expect to see is similar to what people on ketogenic diets are seeing. And we don't know how to interpret those yet, even. So it's there's a lot up in the air. I think... Honestly, if groups have been sparse on sharing labs or getting labs, it's because we generally don't care because uh, uh, we're going to come back to that same idea. The labs, the ranges are predicated on high carb plant eating diets and a lot of people feel it doesn't apply. And then secondly, if, if you're feeling healthier than you've ever felt in your life, are you going to change your diet because like your total cholesterol went up or something like that? I don't know. There are things that you could look for that are just general health markers like CRP and insulin. Those would be great ones to look at. And I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think Sean Baker has been arranging to collect voluntary lab blood work from people who tried out his World Carnivore Month or even um, went carnivore on his N equals many experiment sometime before. So that might be a good place to look for what the range of things that people are seeing is. I think it's a good point what you mentioned, that that you don't bother testing because you feel good. And that's, you know, you often have a load of blood work done because you're not feeling right and you're trying to find the problem. But if you're feeling great, then there's 
not really so much need to go and get all that blood work done in the first place. Yeah. That said, if you do become ill, your first thought is, geez, I wish I had a baseline <laughs> so I could see what changed here. So Very true. it's probably a good idea to get that kind of routine checkup now and then. But I'm not sure what you would do in response to a particular value. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, troubleshooting questions. Uh, the first one is from Heather McLean, who gave zero carb a go, but felt very physically sick in the night, um, about six hours after eating her last meal. Um, I asked her for a bit more information. You know, how long was she doing it before she started feeling a bit crappy? Was she strict all the time, etc., etc.? Uh, she said she was having a maximum of five grams of total carbs the day she wasn't strict, zero carb, which allowed for very few veggies or a few nuts. She was strict four days straight, three nights she was sick after becoming strict. She did zero carb for 17 days in total. Um, I remember her discussing this and I wondered whether it was a case of potentially not doing it strict enough for long enough or whether it just simply didn't agree with her. Yeah, that's a tough one. I just feel like without a lot more information, it's hard to know what was going on. It's not at all a typical result for people to feel sick. I have heard of a kind of keto adaptation all over again problem where people begin to feel that kind of keto flu almost. Um, so it could have been something like that, but there are just so many possibilities. I don't know that I could really hazard a guess. No, exactly. It's a, it's a bit difficult to tell, isn't it? But, you know, to be honest, if something is really making you not feel good, then probably the best thing to do is to stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. Like you say, with the sort of keto flu thing, and you might go through um, a similar thing when transitioning to, to carnivore. There's, it might be something that you put up with, a f with for a few days or maybe even up to a week. But if you're continually still feeling bad after that time, then it's probably a sign that it's not really for you. Right. And if we could go into it deeply, like I could talk to her one on one for a while, maybe we'd discover that she started eating a food more that she really didn't eat a lot before carnivory that maybe had that she gave some trigger or any number of things but you'd, I think you'd really have to if she really wanted to do it for for some reason um, which I can well imagine because the benefits for a lot of people have been great then I think she'd really need to sit down with someone to go over the, the entire like all the lifestyle things that are going into that mm-hmm Okay, this is another question from Erin. There are a lot of people who transition to zero-carb carnivore from keto and they experience weight gain. Why do you think this happens, even if they are not coming from a restrictive eating background? I don't hear about that a lot, except in that case she brings up, which is the history of severe calorie restriction or over-exercising, where uh, I think perhaps you're, you've gotten into this a uh, well-known state where uh, long-term starvation then encourages your body to just put on a lot of weight as soon as the nutrients are available. There could be something like that going on. Maybe if there were a nutrient deficiency, your body's just saying, give it all to me and don't spare, don't worry about <laughs> overweight. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't hear about that problem very much, but maybe I'm not active enough in the groups. I would say that I would give it some amount of time, maybe decide in advance how long you're going you're gonna to allow this to go on before it resolves. Because obviously, I mean, back when I started it, I started it completely for reasons of vanity. And if I had gained weight instead of lost weight, I don't think I would have ever stuck with it for more than a couple of weeks. But I, on the other hand, I know that I've heard many stories of people who initially put on some weight um, and, and sometimes they were insistent that it wasn't lean mass, that it was fat, that their clothes were fitting worse, but that um, it balanced out. And over after a little while, their body adjusted and it brought them down to a new set point. So I, I don't know. I, weight set point, as I mentioned in our 
last episode is a little bit of a mystery to me. I don't know. There are a lot of factors that go into it. And although that result is surprising to me based on the majority, I guess it, if it happens sometimes, there's probably some reason that your body's wanting to hang on to that nutrient or fat level. Yes, I think that's often what it comes down to. I have seen it, um, you know, a fair few times, especially with women, uh, when they start keto, that that they either don't lose weight for a period of time and, you know, quite frankly, that's usually at least high up on the list of, of why people are changing their diet. Um, they don't lose weight or they sometimes even even gain weight. But in most cases, they're feeling better and so they carry on with it and it does stabilize after a while and the weight does start coming off. And yes, my feeling is from a logical perspective is that there's just something going on in your body that needs to happen first. You know, there's some healing that needs to take place and your body just holds on to that weight until it sorted that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one's, this one's another, this one's another funny one from Lucretia Campenga. My urine smells something fierce. Different from keto pee, she says. <laughs> if I were out in the bush and peeing to mark my territory, I'm telling you, even the lions and other big predators would keep far away. I've stopped having stinky breath and my armpits even smell good. I don't wear deodorant at all. Is the stinky pee thing normal? She has been zero carb for five months. Stumped. <laughs> I've never <laughs> heard that one before. <laughs> No idea. I mean, obviously it's not asparagus, so what else could it be, right? <laughs> no idea. Lucretia is amazing. I, I really appreciate her so much. I've seen her here and there on different fora, and she, her transformation is just so inspiring to me. So I'm glad she came in with a question, and I'm so sorry I couldn't answer it. <laughs> Sorry, Lucretia, we don't have an answer for your fierce smelling urine. <laughs> <laughs> this one is from Cheryl Myers. What happens if you fall off the wagon, i.e. eat some low-carb, high-fat vegetables, drink a glass of wine, uh, etc. once in a while for social reasons? Is it hard to go back? And... Uh, Yes, that's that that picture of a glass of wine now is in is in my head. What do you do about that? Do you allow alcohol into your life? Ah, uh, yes. A lot of people don't. I didn't drink any alcohol for the first 5 years carnivorous and then wow. I tried it and it was okay and so then I I added it back into my life, having maybe a drink once or twice a week. And that's been more or less okay. And then then I found old kind of semi-alcoholic tendencies starting to creep up on me. And it felt like I was just drinking too much. And it, it, you know, it wasn't maybe compromising my health that much, but I didn't feel like I felt my best either. And so then now I've cut it back down to much more special occasions like... Uh, my birthday a couple of days ago, I had quite a bit to drink. Uh, really, not um, <laughs> exemplary lifestyle there at all, but it, but it's, it's a rare thing. Um, and I think that carnivores vary in what their opinion is on that. As to falling off the wagon, I think the difficulty of getting back on comes from two things. One is practice. <laughs> Um, and one is what your motivations are for doing it. If you're just kind of curious and you think it's cool and then you have some occasion where there's something that you like and you eat it, the chances are that you're just going to keep eating that. But if, if you have a problem like I did with mental health, um, it's just, there's no question that if, if I have some food for some reason and, and whatever reason, even if it doesn't really punish me that much, uh, the next day is just going to be full on carnivore again because I just can't afford that. I have another friend who's been carnivore about the same time as me. We met back on that Zeroing In on Health Forum. And her first year, 
she decided at Thanksgiving she was going to have some Brussels sprouts. I mean, imagine your your idea of a delicious cheat is to have some Brussels sprouts on Thanksgiving. <laughs> sprouts. How bad can it be, right? <laughs> and she immediately had huge uh, reintroduction of joint pain that had completely dissolved for her. Immediate punishment. And so if, if that's what you're dealing with, it's just not going to be that hard to get back on. Yes, I, I think that's the thing. Uh, if it's... That, that and that would be the case for me if it was just about weight loss and maintaining my weight loss it probably wouldn't be enough but the fact is that if i go back to eating a higher carb diet i get my migraines back and i get my depression back and that's too much of a price to pay for eating that way so it's the balance with the scales, isn't it? What you've got on one side and, and what you've got on the other. And is the motivation enough to get you back on the wagon or not? Mm -hmm. And it's often a lot harder to live your life off the wagon, quite frankly, if you've got to put up with these other things that really set you back in your life. It is. That said, I mean, if you fall head down into a cake... Obviously, your cravings for sugar are going to go back up and those first few days are going to be white knuckling it and it might take a few tries to get really back on if it's keto or carnivore. But when the incentive's there, you'll do it eventually. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, this one's from Ashley Samane. Ridiculous question ahead, she says, joking. I don't expect this question to make the cut because, duh, we aren't dogs. I am, however, curious. We feed our dog uh, raw meat, yet he still seeks grass from time to time. I thought dogs were considered carnivores, but maybe not. And uh, yes, not ridiculous question because <laughs> it's uh, it's close to my heart too. I I have I have um, a dog also that I feed. Um, she does actually have a bit of uh, a bit of vegetable in her mix, but but not much. It's it's basically. Um, a raw meat diet and yes she does she does also seek grass from time to time to eat so I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that well this one was so interesting I had to look into it a little bit <laughs> um, I have cats I don't have dogs and I'm not as familiar with dogs I know that cats eat grass actually as an emetic to help clear up out their system by making them vomit mm. but I didn't know about dogs apparently somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of dogs reportedly do eat grass, and there are a lot of theories, and no one really knows why. Um, some people think that it might have that same emetic function, but uh, when uh, when surveys were done, it turned out that um, only somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of dogs reportedly actually vomited after eating grass, so it seems maybe not a great explanation. Um, other people have proposed that maybe they have nutritional imbalances, but because it doesn't seem to depend on what you feed them and because dogs can't actually digest grass, that seems really highly unlikely. Um, but uh, people are grasping at straws because it's such a mystery. Um, there are a couple evolutionary theories that I ran into. One is that it helps purge parasites. Apparently even wolves do this and um, some people think that that is the function it's serving. Someone suggested that it disguises the scent of feces. I'm kind of skeptical of that. Um, yeah, I don't think they'd be too bothered about that, quite frankly. No. <laughs> when you're a top carnivore, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the only other suggestion that I came across was that they may have developed a taste for it based on eating stomach contents. And I don't know. None of it seemed persuasive to me, so it's a, it's a great open question. Um, yeah, another <laughs> one we don't know the answer to. And it, and it is funny because... I, I can see the logic much more with cats um, that they need to make themselves to get up things like, you know, their, their, their fur balls and things that they've got in their mm -hmm. stomachs. But And certainly my dog sometimes, yes, do throw up after eating grass, but yes, not always. And it, and, you know, and it goes straight through. So we don't know the answer. <laughs> I wonder if it going through could also help clear out like fur and... Uh, um, mm, possibly. I guess in the wild... They would be eating more whole prey, so maybe that comes into play there. I don't know. Cool question, though. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry we can't find an answer. <laughs> well, we do have a couple more questions, but I am going to have to bring it to a 
close there. I could carry on talking to you for hours. It's been really fun. <laughs> it's a fascinating subject. Yeah. It has. I really enjoyed it. But perhaps we could wrap up with a top tip from you. I don't know if this is so much a tip as uh, reiterating something I've been saying from the beginning, I hope, which is that your your hunger is a really valuable tool. And I, I know that in some people, hunger has gotten mixed up with other problems. But I think for the most part, when you learn to trust your body and eat to satiety, it's usually going to be to your benefit because hunger is signaling that you're not getting enough nutrition. If you're on a high carb weight loss diet, it's well known to be a hunger inducing diet. And I believe that's because you're losing lean mass and, and your fuel is just not being partitioned the way that your body really wants it to be. Ketosis and ketogenic diets have been known to get around that and actually let you tune into your hunger. And I would propose that a carnivorous diet does that to an even greater degree. So my tip would be, even if you think it's sending you out of ketosis, even if you think it's temporarily causing a weight stall, and maybe some caution might be advised if you've got blood sugar issues, but otherwise, follow your hunger, eat as much as you really want to, and find out where that leads you. You may be pleasantly surprised with what your body does when you actually feed it what it needs. Fantastic. Well, you've certainly inspired me to to give it another go so i shall <laughs> i shall let you know how i get on with that great i can't wait to hear <laughs> well thank you very much for today it's been fantastic what a pleasure my honor thank you great to get the resources and links from the show please go to ketowomanpodcast.com are you my next extraordinary woman maybe you've got an idea for a show a topic you want to hear about let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. It's thanks to the two Keto Dudes that I'm hosting this podcast, so please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes and Facebook. Every star and review really does help. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support means the world to me. Thank you. This week's quote is from Fran Leibowitz. My favourite animal is steak. Bye-bye, keto lovelies. Bye-bye.